Welcome to lecture 26 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we will look at building your own software defined radio software interface. So, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, lecture, um, regarding uh, several of the advanced software defined radio implementations that are out there, in order to enable the wireless practitioner to test out new designs and ideas, it is vitally important that the hardware comes along with some sort of software support in order to implement these radio designs. So software defined radios uh, require um, um, interfaces, software interfaces and development environments that would enable the wireless practitioner to create new systems at the network and physical and Mac layers um, such that they can they can be deployed with a relatively small learning curve in learning that software package right um, and uh, currently there are a variety of different solutions out there um, for implementing uh, software defined radios first in the software domain before porting it to an actual hardware platform but you have to be careful because a lot of these um, different uh, uh, software packages, even though uh, they've been around for several years, some of them still suffer from uh, underdeveloped documentation. Uh, there might be a steep learning curve associated with them. And some examples may or may not work um, in the real world or under just very constrained circumstances. So as a result, there are challenges associated with coming up with some sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, a process of where you can take a design from paper or from your, the drafting board and tra translating it into software, which can then be deployed onto a hardware platform and then for transmission over the air. So, as a result, this lecture will talk about one particular story that started at WPI with the master's thesis of Michael Lefferman, which was sponsored by the MathWorks. And this story describes sort of the, 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 the creation of what is now the SDRU blocks uh, from the MathWorks that's used in a communication toolbox for interfacing the USRP hardware with MATLAB and Simulink. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that master's thesis started with. And, and it's, you know, the things have definitely evolved since the, uh, the creation of that interface in uh, 2009, but we're going to describe what are some of the things that you need to think about when implementing a software interface for your SDR platform. All right. So uh, first, the design flow. So you need to, uh, it would be great if you can leverage existing software. And in this case, uh, the decision was, well, because, you know, MATLAB and Simulink already have extensive toolboxes and models of communication systems and such, we would not need to reinvent the wheel. We would leverage those existing tools. And all we need now is a way of interfacing those tools with a software-defined radio platform. So streaming-based software solutions are ideal for debugging radios and simulation and then running the radios in real time. And what we want to do is essentially it would be great if we had something that was visual so we can more readily see how all the flow of information works and the graphical programming language um, is somewhat more accessible to a certain extent in terms of people understanding where everything fits in the greater scheme of things. So it's great for visual learners and such. So how does the design flow for the Simulink interface between Simulink and MATLAB and the USRP2, um, and now it's a USRP N210, but it's all part of the same family of software-defined radios. How does it work? So let's take a look, okay? Okay, so let's look at the design flow. So we have our computer host. Okay, so that's our computer host. And that's where all the baseband implementation of our um, wireless communication system is being being uh, being deployed, right? And in that, uh, we have essentially our Simulink and MATLAB environment and all its libraries, right? Uh, the toolboxes and stuff. So Simulink plus MATLAB. And that information is exchanged or like we have some sort of USRP lib. And what that does 
is essentially translates the incoming and outgoing information into UTP, UDP packets that are then fed to a gigabit ethernet port or a connection and that cable goes to the radio, right? So that's my uh, USRP platform. And then there, um, that information, so this is UDB packets, are converted into essentially the I and Q information that then is uh, fed into or fed from the RF daughter cards that are ultimately sent over the air or are received over the air. So, so what ends up happening is we start with, uh, let's say our hardware that's in the bottom part here, the platform, so that's our SDR hardware. Hardware. And the information is packetized once it's converted from um, the uh, RF frequencies down to baseband frequencies into packets. It's then fed to the gigabit ethernet uh, port on the computer host, converted um, from the packetized format uh, using the USRP lib. So USRP lib is basically the, the mapping between the packets and the actual information that can be used by Simulink and MATLAB. And then in the Simulink and MATLAB environment, the, the blocks, the SDRU blocks, or whatever blocks that are used to interface with the platform, then take it and import it or export it, depending on whether it's transmitting or receiving, into your model or from your model for further processing and then hopefully the extraction of information into what you're looking for, whether it's video or text or audio. So in, in Simulink, we're going to have both a receive block and a transmit block. Um, nowadays, we have the SDRU transmit and receive blocks that accomplish a connectivity between the USRP platform and, the, um, and Simulink and MATLAB environments. Um, so let's, at the time when uh, Michael Lefferman um, implemented these interfaces, uh, he had to come up with some creative ways of interfacing Simulink with the USRP. And so let's look at how the transmit thread was implemented. So the transmit thread looks like, like the following. So here's our Simulink thread. And suppose this is our sending thread. Okay. So what ends up happening is uh, we, first of all, let's say have something called MDL start. Start. And what that does is it says start the Simulink thread. And then you create the thread. Okay. And then you also create a FIFO, first in, first out buffer. So create the thread now has something called, uh, creates now that sending thread and create the FIFO creates the mechanism by which we feed information, the sample FIFO, the sampling information from Simulink into that thread that will be sent to the USRP lib. Then we do is MDL outputs and what that does is load the samples created by Simulink into the FIFO which then gets sent out into the data stream right and so that information gets fed into the FIFO and is and is uh, uh, gets filled up into thread that progressively gets converted into UDP packets to get sent over to the radio and then we have MDL terminate that ho hopefully cleans everything up and brings everything to a conclusion and um, uh, it basically sends an interrupt which then stops the thread and, and, and cleans up the memory and such. So that's how the transmit thread works between uh, for the USRP Simulink interface. Likewise, at the receiver, we again need to figure out 
how we thread information in Simulink in order to uh, take information off of, uh, in this case, the UDP packets that are arriving from the gigabit ethernet cable and uh, an adapter um, and translate them into information that can be used by Simulink. So let's look at that now, shall we? Likewise, for the receive thread, so suppose we have our Simulink thread here. And this is our RX data handler. Okay. What happens is again, we do MDL start. And then it says create thread. And creates the thread here. Then it says create the FIFO. So same thing, creates the FIFO, which again is our bridge. But the FIFO is now working in the other direction. It's actually taking things from um, the received data that's being converted from uh, the UDP packets received from USRP uh, using USRP lib into information that then gets fed the received data, RX data, into Simulink. And so what we get is MDL output takes those samples and loads samples from FIFO into the Simulink environment. And then we convert into the right data type and everything. And then at the end, when we run out of samples, we say MDL terminate in order to end the process. And then that stops everything. In order to get a better understanding of how the USRP takes data before it packages up into UDP packets that are sent across a gigabit ethernet cable to the computer host and Simulink, we need to understand about a little bit more about what's happening with the sampling that's occurring on the USRP platform. So let's take a closer look at that. So let's suppose we have our USRP system. We have our daughter card, so I'll call it DC. And our daughter card has an analog to digital converter, uh, connected to an analog to digital converter, two of them, right? And a couple of DACs, digital, uh, uh, sorry, analog digital and digital analog converters, right? And we know that the ADCs and the DACs are 100 mega sample per second. And that's fixed. Right? And they have different resolution. The uh, ADCs have 14 bit and the DACs have 16 bit. Now, on the USRP motherboard, oops, sorry, wrong direction. Ah. What you've got on the FPGA, so this is the FPGA, is you have essentially for the uh, analog digital conversion afterwards, you have um, a high data rate half band filter. You have a, a low data rate half band filter and then the CIC filter, okay? And that's the same thing here. Two half band filters and a CIC filter. And then likewise, um, you have the exact opposite operation with the low and high data rate half band filters. Okay. And so it around here, um, in addition to um, uh, like the FPGA, so this is the, uh, let me draw this in another color. So this would be where you would do the processing for your in phase component of your baseband signal. This would be for the quadrature. Likewise on the uplink, when you do go from uh, uh, 
when you transmit, this would be your I and that would be your Q. You would also have, um, as part of this process on the FPGA, you would have the, um, the down sampling, the up sampling of the information by whatever your decimation rate is. And then all of that information is fed or comes from, right, your Ethernet controller, so EC that then talks by gigabit ethernet to your host. Note that on top of that, you have at least in the USRP 2s, you don't have that anymore with the USRP N210s. You had an SD card and, and, and uh, a C CLPD, and uh, sorry, uh, CPLD that Feed, that feeds that information into the configuration to your FPGA. Nowadays, whenever you initiate your uh, USRP N210, that automatically gets fed right across the ethernet before anything starts. So that takes the place of the, ether, uh, of the SD card that you would see on the older models of the USRP. So essentially the analog to digital and digital analog converters are fixed at their sampling rates of 100 mega samples per second. And so what this means is that the decimation rate that's used really um, is, is to sort of th throw away uh, as much information as possible to, to, to a manageable size or size uh, uh, over unit time that can be handled by Simulink and the computer host. So whenever you use a decimation or interp interpolation factor of 512, um, you actually have, um, a, you know, given that fixed sampling rate of the A to D and D to A, um, we actually we we actually create different bandwidths of the resulting signal. So if you're in receive mode and you're decimating by 512, what you're really seeing when you let's say put an FFT scope um, to to the radio um, uh, to, in Simulink and you're looking at what's coming from the radio, you're actually looking at 97.6 kilohertz of spectrum. Likewise, if you have an interpolation or decimation factor of two, what you're actually looking at is 25 megahertz of spectrum. So that's quite a bit more. And then likewise, transmission's about the same. So if you send data and you have a decimation factor of two, you're actually sending 25 megahertz of information um, across that bandwidth, while a decimation or interpolation factor of 512 will give you a 97.6 kilohertz wide signal.